explained at length, inadequate financing and investment. This is not to say there isn't financing. There is a lot of money, but does it reach the people who require it is the question. And if it doesn't, I'm seeing nods in the room, if it doesn't, how do we make that happen? Those are some of the things we need to discuss in this panel. Um, limited technology transfer and skill. And um, deploying large scale renewable energy projects in networks with poor transmission and distribution infrastructure. I have seen this a lot in Kenya where we put up large um, projects out in the middle of nowhere where there is no infrastructure. So it's another cost trying to drive the infrastructure there. How do we plan this out properly? How do we put this together? <coughs> So some of the opportunities that we've seen, and for those who are looking, investors especially and finance, um, uh, financiers who may be looking for opportunities in the energy development in Africa, we have a variety of renewable and non-renewable energy sources. Um, solar, wind, geothermal, all those coming up in various countries at various levels. There's an increase in national and um, regional level policy and commitment. Now in Kenya, I know we have wonderful policies, absolutely amazing policies. However, our implementation is questionable. So if we have people who come from other African countries where implementation is a little better, or even from India, maybe give us your experiences on how you've developed your implementation strategies, because policies are there. We don't need any more. But could we implement what we have? Okay. Um, emerging financiers, renewable energy advancement, and reduction of cost. So I'll just brush through this because my colleague Joyce, you did a wonderful job. You trained me well. <laughs> oh, wow. So how, how do we as women um, participate in the energy sector in Africa? Um, sadly, we've seen an insignificant participation in decision making and policy processes and in the labor force. Now, there's both inward and outward forces on this, and I'm sure Halila will bring out some of those from the panelists. What are some of the inward forces that um, keep women from participating, and what are some of the outward forces, because there's both ways. Um, there's also a noticeable disproportionate burden on energy poverty, as Joyce has said. And compared to our male counterparts, we as women face more significant health and safety risks from household air pollution. So we're not crying foul to the gentlemen in the room, but we're just saying that's what happens. <laughs> Um, so how do we unlock this? We are looking at uh, promoting productive use um, of energy for women. And there's some of the strategies that we will discuss here. Um, we're looking at reducing the amount of time that women have to use to go collect firewood or collect water and just do a lot more domestic work and getting more productive use of renewable energy. We're looking at targeting policy processes and building capacity of women and transferring skills to them from those who know how. Um, removing investment barriers, I'm glad we've talked about that, and creating equal opportunities for women. It has to be a fair playing ground. Some, most of the times, there is a whole list of requirements and a lot of women entrepreneurs will, like, will tell you that they met all the requirements, but once they submit these to financial institutions or investors, the goal post shifts. Something else is required. So what is the problem? And how do we address that? Um, so what is the solution? Yes, we're looking to recognize women's strengths. Women are 50% of the world population, and 50% of the population is not being considered in different decision making and different areas, then we are failing halfway through. Okay? We're looking to readdress gender based discriminations and remove bottlenecks to women resource access and identify solutions suitable to women's circumstances. That basically summarizes what we are looking at today. Um, so in support of that, 
AMSEM, which is Africa's Ministerial Conference on the Environment, on the environment um, is looking to leverage on new avenues to empower women and youth. So in the 16th session um, of AMSEM held in Libreville, Gabon in 2017, Amson did declare that, um, they did suggest rather, not declare, that a framework is set up for women entrepreneurs, women energy entrepreneurs, to use it as a platform to implement the tasks reflected in the liberal outcome statement, which I will let you know shortly. Um, the other strategy that they asked us to have is to identify members and stakeholders and partners to design ways and modalities of implementation and engagement, and to develop programs and projects that will solicit funds and resources for implementation. So we are looking at both soliciting funds and implementing properly. So can, and once the funds are solicited, could they trickle down to the people who need them for implementation? and creating partnerships to coordinate with existing relevant agencies, including um, UNEF. So, AWEF, as we call it, Africa Women Energy Entrepreneurs Framework, has three key pillars. One being the gender responsive policies, access to finance and markets, and skill and capacity development for all women who are part of this framework. And if you're not, I would suggest that you look through our website and see how you can become a member. So how are we doing this? There's three ways that we have three ways of, um, of an action plan to reach our three key pillars. So we're looking at climate science and research. This will enable us to reach harmonized policies together with the government as we do our research. For skill and capacity development, we're looking at technology transfer and calling in um, uh, sages in different areas to teach women on how to carry out their business, on how to do, I mean, to look at different ways of using their energy and have productive uses for that, and that therefore developing and implementing the projects they have. And lastly, for innovative and climate financing, we are looking for partnerships with different organizations that can help us both for skills and capacity development and also for finance of our projects. So just briefly on, um, just to go over what Joyce has already talked about, um, it's just been two years since AWEF was um, created and we were launched in December 2017. Um, I remember, because I was there. So, so far we have 250 members, and you're all welcome, women. You're all welcome to be part of this framework. So far, 200 have been trained on microgrid applications, and mostly I'm a beneficiary of one of these trainings. And currently, my organization is implementing mini grids in Trukana County in Kenya. Um, spurred and stimulated some interest of uh, private developers, and we are calling in more. We, are not, we, we have more room for everyone. And lastly, the two pilot projects that um, Joyce has spoken about in Tanzania and in Mozambique, mostly women-led fish processing in Mwanza and in Malibu in um, Mozambique. So those are the two pilot projects. We are looking to have them successfully finished and then we can move on to other areas. Um, and that's uh, pretty much what I had to say about our. Wonderful, I'm about to catch you on. <laughs> <laughs> Time is not on our side. Um, thank you so much, Charity. So just to quickly move us along, thank you for setting the scene so well. Two out of three people in Africa lack access to electricity. Okay. Um, now, so basically what you've, you've literally told us what our work here is. Um, before us, we have a distinguished panel panel of, 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 of speakers. However, everyone in this room is in this room particularly for a reason. And I believe the 40 minutes or so minutes we have will kind of help us kind of figure out what are the next action steps, probable other action steps we can take um, to move us forward. We have issue, we've heard issues with access to finance, capacity building, um, policies, uh, lack, lack of policies that work of, um, we've talked about the need for technology that empowers 
Um, and we need to create a fair playing ground for women to actually succeed in the energy sector. Right? I will not repeat some of the great um, the scene setting work that has been done before me. So, um, as I said, my name is Khalila Charles Boy. I am a, um, I run a social, a group of social enterprises in Tanzania, working in the cross section of youth development, social innovation, and job creation. We work in the arts and development space, we work in gender as well as social enterprise ecosystem development. And with the same flow, I will invite our distinguished panelists to um, introduce themselves, but as they introduce themselves, I will land them with a question and um, quickly ask that as you're introducing yourself and probably kind of responding, this is too far, closer, better. Right, uh, as you're responding, let's try to keep um, our responses crisp to the point so that we get through um, what we have on the table for us because I'd really also love to bring in um, our guests, right? So um, to try to keep the, the, your responses about, to about three minutes, um, or four, right? <laughs> or four, um, but I'm looking at the time and it is ticking. So finance, technology, <coughs> Capacity building. Candice, I will start with you. Could you please quickly introduce yourself? And also, um, with regards to capacity, I will throw a question on capacity building to you. Could you please share some of the capacity building models, um, especially those targeting women, that you have seen work and how you think they can be replicated across other initiatives, especially in the energy sector? And of course, you want to tell us what to do, and people, I guess, who understand why I think this question to be particularly. Okay, so my name is Candice Davis. Um, I study chemistry and applied chemistry. I worked for a Swiss chemical company for about five years. And my portfolio was um, managing projects in sub Saharan Africa, uh, particularly with bigger multinationals like Unilever. So I worked in, on sites um, in Kenya, Ghana, Zambia, Zimbabwe. Mauritius in South Africa, managing these projects. Um, in, in my previous corporate job, at that, in that role, um, often what I had to do as part of my daily job was test a local product um, from production um, against one of the global project products from a Unilever, for example. And in all our chemical tests, we almost always found, actually kind of an example, where we didn't find that the, lo the local product was stronger technically than the, the, the global shelf product that we all know and we all buy from. Um, as Africans off the shelf. Um, and, and that I came up quite often in, in my work and um, at some t at stage it was quite difficult for me to see that knowing that um, the local product was stronger but they weren't able to get it in their own market because essentially they were being out-marketed by one of the global multinationals that I was consulting for and working for. And that's when I left that job three years ago and I started my own business and work with local entrepreneurs to help them develop um, their market share, their own markets, because I know technically they're strong enough, um, but there wasn't enough support for them in terms of um, marketing and giving themselves access to their own markets because the multinationals are so strong in that. Um, so so that, that's um, what I, I've been doing for the last few years in that business. Um, and recently I've also started a business on self care, so formulating skin care, hair care products, specifically uh, formulated with um, means of developing self care routines for women like myself as an entrepreneur. The self care is, is something that I, I had to learn <laughs> to be conscious of, and, and I had the chemical background to actually do that in products. Um, so, the question you asked me, um, Helena, was on, on capacity building. Yes. I think for me, it's um, from my previous experience in, in, in the chemical industry, especially internationally, between Europe and, and, and Sub Saharan Africa. For me, it was always quite ironic that um, as Africans, we're sort of trying to catch up with. The Western world, we have a lot of Western technologies are based on ancient African practices or models or technology. So just a simple example is in this room, for example, we're sitting in a closed room with artificial light to control the moderate temperature through air conditioning when in ancient Africa we would have new things like this in communities outside in natural light, with natural sunlight, with natural temperature climates. And Europeans adapt, they, they, they don't have this sort of life throughout the year, they don't have this sort of climate out there, so they develop systems like this for the European market. 
And now, the Africans were trying to catch up to that. We, we, we could literally, all of us, go outside right now and have this meeting in a temporary environment outside with real sunlight for free. You know, so I think that was always just, so it was a funny thing. We try and catch up when like, they've been simulating what we're doing and we get that for free. Um, so um, I mean, that, that's one point to the discussion. And there's so many um, examples that come from Africa in terms of technology and science that have been replicated by the West, and, and we're almost trying to catch up with that. And we don't realize as Africans how powerful we are and how much we sit on in terms of real, key, sustainable, valuable energy sources that, that we can exercise with, with ourselves to see. So one good example, I think, is always um, that I mentioned is the cesarean section. So the women give birth, and that was really, that was replicated from Central African practices. The women would be able to tell that a woman can't give natural birth, so they would actually surgically perform this, and they had herbs that they grew from their own soil, and they give the women and surgically perform this um, procedure. The women would do this on, on other women, um, and that was seen by the Romans and taken over as, as their practice. And today we understand cesarean as this modern technological practice, but it comes from ancient Africa. In, the, in my own country where I come from, um, South Africa, for example, um, in, in ancient South African practice, and still happens today, the women make beer. The women go to the field, they take the crops, the barley, they, they make beer, which is quite difficult to do technically, and they started the beer industry. The South African breweries, if you go to the museum, um, the first step of how they got these recipes for beer, South African breweries became one of the biggest breweries in the world, came from African women who were making beer traditionally in calabashes from the trees. Um, so again, I think we have to be very, very conscious as African women to not try and simulate and run after these models that have been replicated from us. You know, so how can we step back and understand the power we have as, as African women, um, as Africans in general, but particularly women because we're involved a lot with with these technologies that have been taken from us and how can we simulate them in a way that makes sense for us? I'm not sure that answers your question. Um, but in, in building capacity with that, I think we need to, number one, understand where this history comes from. So the history of a lot of technologies we try to simulate with with solar panels, with um, electricity, for example. Um, there are parts of Africa where you have these sources for free, and maybe we don't need that much electricity in that capacity in those regions because for whatever reason, we have those natural resources available, right? So I think when we talk about capacity also, what do the local people need? I think that's very important. And what can we use locally? For some reason, Mother Nature is so giving and so generous to Africa. She's given us so much. So what can we use naturally there that, that makes sense for that environment and not trying to get a system that, number one, was not made for us, that was made for another environment, for another demographic that needed that system and was replicating what we have. So instead of replicating, what's there and rebuilding systems, learning and building system that way for us, right? Right. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, Candice. So, Diane, I'm going to move directly to you. So, Diane, I'm a bit confident with your story, the story of starting your enterprise. Um, Joyce and Charity have said this very well about, you know, that women have fewer opportunities to access skills in, um, in, 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 in education. So, what, the same question, what do you think are the capacity building models that have worked so far um, in what you have seen and what do you feel could be replicated? Um, hello, um, my name is Diane Mboko. I am the founder of an initiative called Millennium Engineers back in Tanzania. Um, what we do is we do development of projects um, um, construction work, uh, implementation, maintaining, capacity building, there is a whole bunch of things. Um, we are specifically um, uh, targeted in solar and wind. We have done works in Sub-Saharan Africa, in South Africa, in Mozambique, in Swaziland, uh, and in Tanzania. And we are, I am among the members of our and uh, highly I would say beneficiary as one of the projects is actually uh, undergoing in Mwanza, which is in our, under our initiative. Um, when we, we talk about women financing, access, capacity building, what works and what doesn't work and what can be replicated, um, I'll go straight forward by saying when I, when I started uh, my initiative back in 2016, I was still quite a university student on my fourth year doing mechanical engineering, uh, I, 
I didn't have a lot of background in terms of business, one. I didn't have a lot of background in terms of renewable energy. And there wasn't much in the country that could help me with that. What I found that worked was um, um, assistance in uh, international accelerator programs. That helped me a lot to accelerate things. Um, incubation, um, hubs, that, those are the places that help me learn what is entrepreneurship. What is the renewable energy sector? Who is in the renewable energy sector? Who should I be talking to? Who should, should I get familiar with? And through that, I, I ran into AWF, which is, I ran into the UNEP, uh, AWF, and many other international organizations. I was able to get partners, I was able to get uh, a good team, and, and so forth. I mean, in terms of financing, um, there are different types of finances for uh, women and entrepreneurship. One outside seed funding, project grants and loans, and equity financing. <coughs> And some of this can be catered with you know, um, international competitions, uh, targeting women, climate change, and social impact. I'll give an example of the currently 2019 uh, Visa Women Initiative that currently just awarded a $100,000 grant to a woman entrepreneur in the energy sector from Cameroon. Um, another sector which can be helpful in terms of financing is international organization. One is being AWEF. Environmental Defense Fund, which is the European under the European Union, uh, which provides funds in on the climate area. <coughs> One being um, a ten million dollar grant fund that is currently running in Tanzania. I'm not sure of some other parts of the world. Um, and then we have USA, we have UK aid, we have WLA, and many of the kind. We also have um, joint ventures funds from the government. Um, I wouldn't say, I would still give them credit, even if it's not highly, but the governments do have funds in terms of through their agencies, institutions, and ministries. Small grants, uh, or if it's not in, in terms of money value, they, they will come in as partners in joint ventures in trying to build capacity in terms of giving you um, access or infrastructure to use, so that in one way or another, adds up to that financing of that project or anything. And then, um, lastly, I would like to say that um, all these areas do provide fi funding in terms of women entrepreneurship in the energy sector, but I think we're still talking about the very smallest group, the minority group. This minority group that has access to, to information. If I, there's a woman like me that would like to be here today, but she doesn't even have access to internet. Who are we? Those are the people we should really be sitting down and talking about. The, the group we are targeting right now, yes, it's good. It's a good initiative to start. But we should now trickle down to the ground level. We should now trickle down to where it really matters. Because there are women that transitioning from fossil fuels into a clean energy will not only be beneficial to, beneficial to their health, but also for them financially. I'll take an example of the works that we're doing in Mwanza where we are trying also to, to phase out kerosene lamps, uh, fishing lamps, into solar. So per year, uh, one, every fisherman um, gets a profit of $2,500 for a year for using this alternative. Now how do they get access to access these te clean technologies? Those are the people that we should be targeting. There are more than 6,200 fishermen across that lake. But we are still a bit higher here. And then I will look at women who do um, smoked fishing. What about transitioning that into solar, so, um, solar dryers? How do they get access to these technologies? How are financial institutions uh, capable to trickle down to reach them? So those are the talks we should really be talking about because those are the high numbers. The numbers we have right now is small and impactful, but I think we could also channel it in a way that can trickle down to understanding the problems that are actually existing on the ground level and at the same time help them to access the funds as much as we are. Thank you. That is wonderful. Wow. I feel like I should clap. I mean, you've raised <laughs> some, key, <laughs> some key issues. So you've talked about the fact that financing is available. <coughs> However, it is mostly coming from abroad. And that what, what, what one of the things that you brought out is that there are initiatives within local governments and governments, uh, government institutions. However, what is being done is not enough. 
and we should look more into how we should reach the grass level communities and women on those levels because so far what we're doing might might be grand however we are missing a huge chunk of women who are not on this train and more that more needs to be done and that leads very well into my question to, to john um john is um the senior natural resource economist for the world bank group and you'll tell us a little bit about that but my question to you is what deliberate programs has the world bank initiated in support of women energy entrepreneurs in africa especially in the areas of capacity capacity building and access to finance and maybe if you could take two minutes that would be wonderful okay thank you <laughs> I'm John Caris from the World Bank. I'm proud of London. I'm in the home. Okay. <laughs> Born in Chigari. So I'm in Chigari. So you could imagine. But you know I am East African. So. That's great. World Bank <laughs> and UN sister institutions. As an economist, I'm a man of figures and facts. With the finance, one of our business in the bank, poverty. Reduction, poverty, education, <coughs> equitable, prosperity, that's the whole part. And then the issues of finance. I would hear share with the team here, potential funding for renewable energy, especially clean cooking. So I would share the information on African continent, and then I focus on East Africa with practical cases, Rwanda as my country home. Women entrepreneurs in renewable energy. Mm -hmm. The figures at the continental level, 600 million Africans, they don't have access to energy. It's a huge number. 80%, 80 zero. It's rural population. You could imagine, and then the bank side, I will show, of course, showing forward looking the World Bank, 2020 and 2030. That's the next 10 years. The potential funding, committed funds, pledged funds, and then specifically for women and youth. World Bank project there all of supporting women and youth, especially through the job creation. I will recall this year in March, <coughs> one planet summit, UN World Bank. The commitment was 22. 0.5 billion. This for climate change, the actions. Big part of this amount should be in four sectors. Of course, part of Paris Agreement, the climate change is an issue. The renewable energy is one of the solutions. How would we take the available funding, the private funding, out of 22 billion within NDC under Paris Agreement, big chunk of that money will be in renewable energy. So. We consider the women and youth as the best people to target so their beneficiaries. So if the question I would answer, I'll bring in three categories, the program. So with Africa, there is Lighting Africa program. This is one of the largest fund projects in Africa. I would also discuss on deep dive, the climate finance renewable energy with the company of technical assistance and capacity building, the component of women entrepreneurs and youth, the beneficiaries. And then I'll bring on policy side, because the World Bank has different arms. Big part is public investment with the government, with the civil society, and then the private sector. So within the innovative approach now, I'll bring also what happened uh, last, I think, two months in DC, uh, World Bank IMF spring meeting, they launched coalition of finance ministers through the actions dealing with climate change, where the renewable energy is part of that one. And then from there, I'll discuss all figures. And then I will also bring on East African countries. Rwanda and Kenya now are demonstrated the countries where they get 24 million USD. Part of that money should be used for capacity building, uh, technical assistance and then demonstrated the cases which will be scaled for our Africa. I think maybe in the discussion I would go in detail based on the question. And then the case of Rwanda as a home country, 
some demonstrated cases are now happening to be scaled up in the other country. I would give also the case of clinic cooking. One of the big challenges as a country, 80% of the country, they are using firewood and charcoal. You could imagine how pollution is. The renewable uh, energy projects now, one of the target is to make sure we shift as a country from 82% to 41%, at least one million household. In the next seven years, we would be really translated from using firewood, charcoal, to improved cookstoves using the modern, I would say, with innovative approach. So then the project that we are talking here, I would use the case and then uh, share the experience, what is happening, what is planning. Of course, there are also some challenges and opportunities. Mm -hmm. If you could see how much more money budgeted for renewable energy and how much more money spent there without you know, being used. And some capacity at the local level are really needed. There is a need to support the women and of course the youth to accept those money. The availability of that technical assistance fund would come up with a proposal, capacity building, and then they support uh, the women <coughs> entrepreneurs. How do they have a uh, bunch of, I would say, bunch of projects to get that funding? Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Just um, your last point you the last point you raised about the technical challenges on the ground you, you talked about capacity building um i'm looking into so basically you're talking about the different bottlenecks that you face as the world bank when it comes to implementing some of the programs that you have on the ground to finance um, some of your initiatives and, and really propel them in. now my question would be if you could if you could kind of simply just quickly outline what are the key issues that the world bank has set in, in, uh, in a multi-sectoral, um, with the multi-sectoral interventions, um, and what do you feel needs to happen for you to be able to make headway um, with propelling large-scale involvement of women and youth in the energy sector? Yeah, thank you. The men and women, of course, and the youth, and then they would have a demonstrated cases, which would be scaled up to the Africa. 24 million, actually, I would say, is allocated according to the regional economic blocks in Africa. They did six economic blocks from West African countries, East African countries, Southern African countries, Central or North. East African countries, they selected two countries, Rwanda and Kenya, were selected. Four million is allocated to specifically for green growth. Part of the money now on capacity building, it's bringing more uh, the people to understand this green concept. Because the renewable energy is one of the new concepts. We talk about the green and the green. Green, grow, clean, cooking is a big part. And then when you see, uh, you analyze the Paris Agreement, NDC, four sectors were really prioritized. This is a renewable energy, which is one of the biggest, and agriculture, smart agriculture, uh, green transportation, and the health <coughs> where we deal with the pollution. On renewable energy, uh, now there is an ongoing study to inform the decision and to come up with evidence. As I mentioned, if you need to have a, a strong capacity building, you should know how many people benefit the project. And now the four countries selected now, they started to work on uh, uh, more on research to come up with the, uh, base, uh, base, I'll say baseline to inform the policymakers. And then two million would be for each country. I'll say four million in East Africa, and then two million for each. And if the country Rwanda now pushed to have one of the private sector arms, because the private sector has different arms. They have women entrepreneurs association within the private sector. And then the bank is using the private sector to come up with the private sector uh, from the women and the men, they come, they use the money. And then from the public sector, the World Bank is supporting the government and then they leverage other development partners. Here I mentioned the World Bank. There's also KFW coming in within the World Bank, European Union, uh, GIZ. They all come together for clean cooking. So the capacity building and technical system, I would say now it's one of the big components. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I will move on um, swiftly to the Honorable Patricia um, Ake. Did I say it? APAJ. There we go. Um, she is a Deputy Minister um, in the Ministry of Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation from Ghana. Um, Madam, I'll invite you to, yes, introduce yourself, but I'll also go straight into my question for you. Um, 
I'm wondering how do we ensure that gender responsive energy policies, priorities and actions are budgeted for and implemented? Thank you very much. My name is Patricia PJ. I'm the Deputy Minister for Environment, Science and Technology. I'm also a member of parliament for the people of Pasukwa, the second highest city in uh, Ghana. And then um, I've also been the mayor of the second largest city before. So I am not too new in the game. Uh, it is a very interesting question over there. And I, I'm not surprised you are not asking me how to move uh, or how we can uh, ensure that we have different models of uh, uh, so, uh, renewable energies that can be promoted within our context. Because Ghana started a long time ago. I'm saying long time ago, as far back as 1992. We had a program to make sure that we are going to stop the flaring of gas. We're also going to stop the use of charcoal. We're also going to ensure that the use of firewood and all those uh, non-sustainable use of uh, gases are stopped. <coughs> all those practices are done away with. But what has happened over the period is that after some, how uh, uh, we say, uh, some initiatives or interventions that are introduced at a point in time, we are not able to implement the actual programs. So I really like your question that we should actually, I should tell you exactly how we are going to introduce or uh, ensure implementation of the budgetary uh, uh, to ensure that budgets for uh, implementing these commitments are, uh, are, are made. One of the things that I feel is critical here is to have the commitment or the leadership commitment. It is a very critical need. The presidency of the government should be committed and come out clearly with its project objective. And that must be articulated very clearly for people to buy. And it is very important that at such we need to ensure that certain roles at the policy design level are reserved for women. Because if we are promoting the agenda of women, that these roles must be must be reserved for women to ensure that we are able to implement these things. And I also want to ensure, uh, uh, say that we should have a direct support for including financial support to be assigned in our budgetary needs. I believe that in that way, that will be making a progress. But one of the things as a member of parliament, which I want to introduce, and on which I insist must be done, as policy makers, is that the government, as a policy developer, is not only there to ensure that these policies are just, we will just make these policies, but we need also set up an institutional dialogue with stakeholders and communicating clearly reforms and the policy agenda. One other issue is to ensure that we have the legal framework to work with. If you have the legislation and you have the regulation, anybody flouting that regulation will be called to book because then the parliamentarians will question why we haven't made provision in our budgetary needs for this particular intervention that is being promoted or committed out there. Because if I talk about the commitment of the, uh, the, the government, every year we have the government come into parliament to indicate its policies, uh, the way it's going to run the program the, uh, for, for the year. And such commitments must be made. And we, as budget uh, 
um, people who pass these budgets should ensure that provisions are made financially to address the need for women intervention in the provision of energy uh, so, uh, sources. So in identifying that, then we have the parliamentary committees. The parliamentary committees will be the champions of this particular agenda. We have the parliamentary committee on energy, we will have the communications, the parliamentary committee on communication, the local government and rural development, the Ministry of Environment, Science and Technology, and then we are also going to have the parliamentary committee on finance, <coughs> championing this particular agenda. Because if they are committed and they understand clearly the intervention that is being introduced out there, there's no way that we can overlook the provision of a budgetary need for that particular uh, uh, agenda. And in doing so, we are not going to be alone. We believe that we have to also engage other champions. The other champions that I've been talking about it's the, uh, uh, we are looking at the uh, CSOs, that, that is, uh, uh, we're also looking at the media, we also look at the, the role of agencies, the uh, public service department, who are the people who do the analytical uh, need for such a, an intervention and it is very important that we engage them and they do the quantitative analysis and come up with a plan and the, the need to pursue this agenda but one of the things that we face one of the difficulties we face is with data the kind of data we have does it really help us to plan adequately to pursue this particular agenda? Especially we have quite a number of the female uh, population who are in the, uh, who are not in the public sector, they are in the private sector. And getting these figures actually don't really help us to promote the right analysis to come up with the right kind of intervention that will help to address these problems. So we have actually identified the need for it. But what remains is to come up with the right policies and the approach of implementation when it comes to the budgetary needs. And in doing this, these champions must be well informed. They should have a very good and critical look at assessing the negatives and positives of the programs that is being put out there. And then we should also ensure that there's a close coordination between government departments and levels of government. We also have to have a listening ear to ensure that we are not hurting anybody along the line who will come out as an incentive for the program that is being promoted out there. So I believe that these policies, if we are able to pursue these agenda in this direction, then we can have a good implementation program to pursue the agenda. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Now, I have quite a few questions and I just kind of want to connect most of the things that you've said. Um, Diane, you talked about the fact that, you know, um, we don't have a lot of um, support from the government side. Um, Honorable Patricia, you did speak about the fact that, you know, there's a, there are a lot of gaps within the government and you, you presented very well some of the things that government can do and what you did bring out is the fact that we need to have open doors where government can engage with entrepreneurs and women in this space. And you brought out something very critical about, you know, the, the act data, um, uh, having a data that would allow you to, um, to, to, to really push this agenda forward. Now, I have, I, 
my, my, my panel was supposed to take all the, to go all the way to 2.30, but I've been told that I've got to close up at 2.10. So I have 20 no. minutes left. I am going to open it up. I am, do not worry, I am going to open it up. So I have a very few minutes. Um, in case you wonder why I'm rushing through it, I was just going to be very transparent with my time limitation. So right now we're going to open it up to the floor. I'm going to take about two or three questions or comments. There's Ritu, um, there's a gentleman up there, and there's a gentleman over there. Um, let's go. Uh, thank you so much. It's been uh, very, very enlightening. And uh, I would like to commit to personally, you know, as a female uh, semi-entrepreneur in the field of renewable energy, if I can uh, learn or share experiences that can help, I would commit to do so. And would be happy to participate and interact with, uh, you know, all of you on the panel. And I believe, uh, I think ORF will have my details. And I can give my card to some of you. Uh, a couple of things. So, you know, we've talked about uh, large initiatives that's like, you know, greening the grid in a big way, which is, you know, really the, where the billions of dollars are going to be required for investment, which will definitely require a top-level, top-down approach from the government. And we've also talked about reaching uh, uh, the ones who've been left out of the grid entirely, you know, the rural people, the 600 million in Africa, and we have 300 million in India who are completely outside the electricity system, who we can assist with smaller projects, which, you know, uh, because they're each very, very <coughs> micro in size, uh, sometimes it could be just one solar panel. So probably the funding would be more widespread and diverse and uh, easier to do. Uh, the one thing that, the, one of the reasons why women have been left out in the space of energy is because if you look, look back historically, energy meant fossil fuels, coal and uh, oil. And mining and drilling were very, very male, men-related jobs. So the sector never employed women. It's not like in other parts of the world you have a very high ratio of female employees in the sector. So as such, the sector historically has not been woman-friendly. Uh, the second thing that comes in is a lot of these jobs in the renewable space have their roots in engineering. You know, whether it's civil, mechanical, electrical, you know. And uh, I don't know what the statistics are, but uh, in India, uh, if in, our, in our engineering colleges, there are 10 male students for every female student. So uh, from a longer term perspective, and you know, this is for other jobs in IT and other things that we were talking about earlier today, we need to have programs that encourage more girls to study science. Because you know you have to study science to then take jobs in engineering. Uh, when you look at small scale uh, uh, solar or particularly solar projects, the rate of employment is seven times more than when you look at solar farms. So they will be cheaper to implement. The amount of funding required from you know different agencies that will give you money will be easier to distribute. And you will be able to generate a lot of employment among the women and youth for that segment. And uh, once you, they're not very difficult to maintain. A lot of uh, reason, you know, there are a lot of solar drives that happen. You can hand out lamps and you hand out other kits, uh, especially where batteries are involved. And if you do not service them, they sometimes spoil very quickly. And people lose faith in it. Say, oh, it worked for two months, it worked for three months, and it's gone bust. So uh, you know, ensuring some amount of quality of what is distributed. But if you train the women, and it does not matter if these are people who have not even had formal education on how to maintain these systems, they will do, uh, not a disrespect to the men in the room, but they are very, very sincere about maintaining things. You know? They're very careful with belongings and possessions. So a little bit of training about how to clean and maintain these little systems and lamps that you give them we ensure that what though there's you know there's success in the products, the lamps and things that you're distributing, and that will uh, really help. Uh, so that was what I had to contribute to. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, this is a friendly show from a uh, regional center, that's the East African Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. Uh, in relation to the ESC. Uh, there is quite a lot of reasons that uh, has come out uh, in the panel. Uh, 
just to keep it short to make the follow up uh, on the previous uh, speaker, the same is that implementation is, is very important uh, of all these policies. Most of our uh, uh, countries in Africa, and especially East Africa, they have good policies that will even cover the uh, aspect of gender inclusiveness, even in energy. But now, coming to how it actualized is a problem. I don't know how the situation is in Ghana, people can share with some experiences. And then, from the experience, what is this very important? Uh, what is this very important uh, approach? That you think, because we, we have got the financing capacity, what is this that is key that can create a faster input? Then another thing is uh, from a regional center is when we work with governments and the uh, issue of data is very critical uh, because data or information is power. But uh, the challenges we are having is uh, the data we receive is very scanty. And uh, it basically makes it difficult even to have responsive policies. And more so when we talk of data that is gender responsive in the space of energy. So I don't know, uh, in your opinion, how do you think uh, the government should, uh, should go so that we can have a reduction that can be helpful in developing gender responsive policies? <coughs> Oh, I think there was another question, right? I think here. I don't have a question. Oh, Michelle, so somebody else has a question, and then you can come back to it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my question is for Diana and for Charity. Uh, Diana, when you, when you were speaking, the what you described as the situation as it stands, especially with the abundance of finance, but um, very poor policy enabling environment, right? Um, because we're in the business of offering solutions thinking, it brought, it brought to my mind the whole idea. I mean, for instance, not even adapt and borrow from one of the, the, the titans of, of, of the African continent, especially when it came to issues around the environment in here, we find the link to Agari Mathai who not only um, reshaped the pedagogy, but also the knowledge production at, at almost a very community-based level in, in, in pertinence to, to the environment. But I mean, what would prevent us from um, applying that very model in the case of energy transition in Africa? And then for charity, um, what, what, what uh, prospects are there for, for instance, um, for the, for, the, for the sector um, to actually pull resources uh, to leverage the financial markets, for instance, by buying down um, certain risk categories um, in favor of now the private se sector uh, investing into that, because some of the issues that you raised um, uh, bring up that. And, and why, I'm even bring, why I'm raising that issue, for instance, there's already existing frameworks. Um, Mr. Kalisa raised the issue of the AFDB, for instance, with the light Africa, um, but there's also the new energy deal for, for Africa, which is actually just due in 2025. So I think those are just the two questions that I have. Um, Megan Florida from the Barefoot College. <clears throat> I think that was a really intelligent and great comment that you just made. What is always surprising to me is how little um, we in Africa seem to be able to know what each other are doing. And that is really a, a big problem. And this space, the climate space in general, as well as this specifically the uh, renewable energy space, has been largely co-opted by men. Because I would argue women have, we've allowed that to happen. Um, because instead of asking for $100,000 for models that scale and put women in the middle, we should be asking for $100 million. Um, because that is what it's going to take. And so our whole thinking has to change away from 
oh, we are women and we need to put ourselves into a position. Um, for the last 10 years, Barefoot College has been developing methodologies for training illiterate and semi-literate women to be solar engineers in six months. Those women today have started the only solar hardware company in the world designed, installed, fabricated, repaired, and maintained only by women. We work in 37 countries in Africa. We brought light to a million people, women, women who don't have a certificate, who didn't go to college, who haven't got a formal education, and who are leveraging their power, no pun intended, not only for access to energy, but also they have become entrepreneurs. There are five barefoot colleges in Africa built that are training women. Those are joint ventures, institutions, co-funded by the government of India and the government of those five host countries. Come and join us. We have a movement. These women are changing the face of how women interact with renewable energy. I would highly invite all of you to come find me at this conference. Um, I think we, we could do something really special if we scale that movement. And take you purpose. <laughs> Wonderful. So I've been told that I have, I have 10 more minutes, <laughs> which is more than what we had before. Um, so I want, what I wanted to do was to um, just bring everything back to the panel, if there's nobody else, and um, just ask you to bring in your closing interventions as you answer some of the questions that have been, um, have been directed to you, or if you feel strongly about something, um, something else, please bring that up. Um, there, was, um, there, were, there, there have been partnerships, or partnership opportunities that have been raised by Rita from Strauss and from Ritu, from Ritu and, the, and, 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 and um, right now, and there have been questions about data and the data required, um, as well as um, there's been a question about knowledge models. Um, and that question, I think, was raised to uh, charity as well as Diana. Um, so, without further ado, starting with you, charity. Okay. Cool. So, okay. so, I'm wondering whether the question addressed to me was addressed to me as. And a Awif or a strong selection. But I will answer as Awif. <laughs> okay, yes, Strauss energy. Um, so in terms of um, strategies that we'll, uh, well, I want to believe Awif, we're using as, um, for Awif, I just pulled up this slide, <coughs> just so I can show you the partners that we are working with and, um, this is the call that we had as well for more partners and avenues for which we can get funding as well. So, so far we have the UN Environment and UN Women, as you can see there. We also have UN University, so that's under the UN. We have the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, for Iceland and AMSEN, which was the overall um, organization here, and PACJA. So, I think actually I should mention this, that ORF is one of the logos we don't have here that we are hoping to have um, by the end of this conference, hopefully. So uh, if anybody from ORF is listening. And from the one sitting um, at this round table, there's an opportunity for you as well to join this initiative to help. It's, it's not a one-man show. It's a framework that's supporting women entrepreneurs, women in energy entrepreneurs, and how we can push forward the agenda for having you know, more gender responsive um, policies, build on our capacity, and implement. We have projects, but we need partners to help us implement on it. So I hope that answers the part on um, partly what was asked. And my colleague Ryan at the very end also wants to add to it as well. Yes, so <laughs> my name is Ryan Dongi. Uh, I'm actually working with the UN Environment and actually uh, the lead in this AWIF program. So just to pick up on what Megan has said, I just want to, to ensure that we're not uh, getting this wrong. AWIF is just, is just a framework, yeah? So we are not, we are actually inviting synergies. For example, yes. I like what uh, Barefoot has actually come up. So partnerships in terms of synergy, in terms of we're not reinventing the way, right? We're actually just a framework 
that uh, is connecting these women entrepreneurs, business partners, uh, government developers actually to what's the goal? The goal is actually to empower uh, African women in the energy sector in terms of entrepreneurship and business. So this is a platform for you, right? You are the owners of Huawei, right? We're just facilitators, right? As your environment, we're just facilitators. You are the owners. So use the platform, network, right? Network is purpose, as our deputy director has actually mentioned. And uh, let's see something coming forth, concrete projects and solutions from, from this meeting. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Ryan. So... <laughs> <laughs> they put pressure on you. Pressure. <laughs> pressure. <laughs> 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes now. No time. <laughs> close. We have to close. Unfortunately, we are at 22 because we are at 220. And I'm sorry I'm going to interrupt this conversation. But, but we, we should allow a couple, uh, uh, one sentence from each of the panelists. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> My time from the open side. Uh, I would really encourage the women and entrepreneurs here, men of course, the women. There's a lot of money coming from the women. I would give an example of the 24 million I got there. And there's also the money in the banks. We, the, the old bank does collaborate with the open banks in the countries. If I give the case of one, I'm really really interested in the open bank. But one of the challenges we are facing in the old bank at Rwanda is capacity. The local people they don't really understand how they do the money. The money is for renewable energy, especially solar energy, wind energy, and the green culture. You could see uh, the token bank is really struggling to use the money because money is really the money potential for the business. Thank you. Thank you. What I was trying to drive out is the fact that we actually have to adopt a gender responsive budget in preparing national and departmental budgets. And that is one of the key things. But I believe that before we can do that, we need to understand we will have to bring everybody along by coming up with champions who can ensure that it is one way to go about this particular agenda. Thank you very much. I think on the data point, um, it's, it's very crucial, as, as Diana was saying. Um, I think women entrepreneurs are, are really need to be driving that force into how we get better data um, off the, the ground floor because the women who cannot be here, um, so we actually represent those women. Um, us as entrepreneurs are really like, in much more in touch with those women on the ground floor. So I think we, we have a responsibility from our side to bring that to the table. Another point is, um, as was raised yesterday, is I think there's not one by one different country free. We do such a diverse countries, and our needs for, for clean energy in the countries are quite different. We also have to be very conscientious of that when we speak for our certain things. Um, uh, I'll just speak a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, I would like to say, we, I, I think right now it's time to drop whatever is sustainable. That is the yes, model. And how do we use this sustainability is by making these funds revolving funds in such a way that they will not just scatter for one project, but they will revolve to help more and scatter and scale up higher. So I think with what we have, we can do more and replicate that and multiply it to give the result more. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That um, concludes our panel for this afternoon. Um, you have all been a great audience. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, no, thank you very much. A photograph of all the families and yours. Yeah. With you, Becky.